thank you. It's wonderful to be here and um, to be presenting this co-authored paper with Rebecca, who cannot be with us, but is following online. All right. Moses Shapira, 1830 to 1884, was a Jerusalem-based bookseller and antiquarian, perhaps the best known seller of antiquities and manuscripts in Palestine in the 19th century. Shapira continues to be well known today for his sale of 1,800 fake items of Moabitica to the German government in 1873, and especially for his attempted sale of a manuscript of Deuteronomy in Berlin and London in 1883, a manuscript he claimed was an ancient version of the book, but which was identified by scholars as a forgery. While the Moabite pottery, and especially the Deuteronomy manuscript, have received much attention, scholars have generally failed to put them in broader context. The two of us are both interested in such contexts. Rebecca, in Shapira's role in transferring Middle Eastern manuscripts and knowledge to Europe in the late 19th century, and I and what his career tells us about how the antiquities trade developed in this period. In this paper, we will look at the manuscripts sold by Shapira to the then Royal Library in Berlin and by his estate after his death in 1883, excuse me, 1884. What were they? How did he get them? And how profitable were they? We will then put these manuscript sales in the context of the sales of antiquities of other kinds, including artifacts of clay, stone, metal, and so forth, from Palestine in the late Ottoman period. As we will show, Shapira's move to sell both manuscripts and other artifacts to European institutions in the 1870s marked an important transition, one that would help transform the nature and scale of the trade in antiquities from Palestine. The Royal Library has a total of 54 manuscripts from Shapira. 18 of these, including Shapira's handwritten catalogs, were acquired from the state through Professor, Professor Hermann Strach in 1885 and 1887. Shapira's own sales to the Royal Library took place over the course of nine years, from 1873 to 1881. It is not clear how the relationship was first established, but Shapira was already known in Germany thanks to the Torah scrolls he offered for sale through the Frankfurt-based bookseller Johannes Alt in 1870. Shapira's first sale of four manuscripts in 1873 seems to have taken place in at least two installments. That year, Moritz Steinschneider, Hebrew bibliographer and assistant librarian in the Royal Library, announced in his bibliographical journal, Hebraische Bibliography, that the library had, quote, had acquired, quote, two Arabic Hebrew manuscripts from Shapira of Jerusalem when he was passing through, end quote. Stein Schneider also noted having had only a few moments to examine what would become the library's manuscript Oriental Quarto 554, a 15th or 16th century copy of a commentary by Shlomo Hagofe. Shapira was paid 140 taler for the two manuscripts, Oriental Folios 627 to 628, both copies of a quote-unquote unknown Yemenite ritual. Whereas the liturgical content interested Stein Schneider deeply, the presence of Babylonian vocalization on non-biblical Hebrew gave him unease, and he questioned how this ancient Assyrian vocalization system could have been retained by the Yemenis into the 16th century. Stein Schneider also noted the need to be cautious given the concurrent sales of Shapira's dubious Moabite pottery. Yet by the time Stein Schneider published his catalog of Hebraischen Handschriften in the Royal Library in 1878, such fears about authenticity had been allayed. Indeed, they may even have been put aside that same year as the library made a second purchase later in 1873 for 76 taler of the aforementioned manuscript of Shlomo Harofe and a third unknown Yemenite ritual, Manuscript Oriental Folio 629, which may have helped prove that such vocalization was commonly found on Yemenite manuscripts. According to Stein Schneider's catalog, Shapira visited Berlin again in 1877 with a collection of 50 manuscripts. While no catalog or list from Shapira detailing this collection has been found, there's evidence of his inventorying them and the accession numbers he left on some of his 1877 manuscripts. These numbers were also noted by Steinschneider in his catalog. In fact, Steinschneider was the only cataloger to make a note of the Shapira numbers. Tracking and investigating Shapira's own numbering system is crucial to our understanding of how his manuscripts were collected and sold, their profitability, and perceived scholarly value. So, for example, Manuscript Oriental Quarto 576, a traditional Yemenite prayer book known as a Tiklal, was purchased by the Royal Library in two parts, although Berlin's acquisition records do not fully reveal this. The first part of the manuscript, 156 folios, contained a, quote, 
collection of prayers corresponding in all to the extraordinary Yemen rite on parchment from the 16th century, end quote. The collection of prayers was purchased as part of Shapira's 1877 offering to the library and bore his number 30 on the flyleaf. However, when we examine the manuscript today, we find a second part appended to the 156 folios originally described by Steinschneider in 1878, and this is a missing first 93 folios of the book. On the first parchment leaf of these missing folios, we find the number 207. Looking for number 207 in Shapira's catalogs isn't straightforward because he copied out and updated his catalogs several times and they now exist out of sequence. The most complete copy of his catalog of 221 Yemenite manuscripts is copy C, dated 1879 to 80. When one looks for the description of number 207, however, one finds the following, quote, an Arabic book seems to be about laws used in Jerusalem. It seems to be pretty old, but has a false date. It has 380 pages quarto, end quote. This description does not match the 93 folios containing a prayer book. To find number 207, one has to consult his catalog labeled double, which is spread across two institutions. The entry for 207 is in the final pages of the double catalog held in the National Library of Israel, copy E. Here the description reads, quote, a Yemenite prayer book upon parchment, only first part of it, namely the order of the general prayers for weekdays and feast fasting, etc., etc., without the hymns part, besides Hoshana, etc. It numbers 93 leaves or 186, end quote. In the case of this manuscript, Shapira clearly did not remember that he had sold 156 matching leaves to Berlin four years prior. The match could only have been spotted when the manuscript was preserved as part of an offering to Berlin in 1881. Curiously, the library's acquisition records show that the price for manuscript Oriental Quarto 576 was 1100 mark, a price that included three other manuscripts offered in 1881, manuscript Oriental Folio 1233 and manuscripts Oriental Octavo 349 to 350. There does not appear to be a record for the original 1877 purchase of the first part of the manuscript, and yet one supposes that Shapira must have been paid for it. This particular sale also reveals some of Shapira's own peculiar cataloging methods. If the two supposedly identical catalogs are compared, we can see that the catalog of 221 Yemenite manuscripts, section D of Oriental 1342, was written after the double catalog section of the National Library of Israel, section E. As you can see from the table, the sale of his manuscript number 207 has affected his numbering system, and 207 is now missing from the later catalog. Thus, rather than keeping one catalog from which he crossed out items as they were sold, he simply wrote out new catalogs, changed numbers, and expanded the information. Apart from this one occasion, the manuscripts offered to the Royal Library do not appear to have altered numbers. This suggests that Berlin was given first choice of the pieces, a suggestion confirmed by comparing the British Museum's records of its purchases from Shapira with Steinschneider's references to Shapira's visits to Berlin. In fact, all the purchases made prior to 1881 correspond to items numbered and described in Shapira's catalog A, Oriental 1343, which appear to be one of his earlier catalogs. By the time some of the manuscripts were offered to the British Museum, they had undergone many changes in numbering. For example, one of the worst cases, British Museum Oriental 2369, a Yemenite copy of the former prophets from 1500 has the numbers 24, 35, 59, and 62 on it, all in different pens and all scored through apart from numbers 24 and 62. Whereas Shapira was systematic in numbering his manuscripts in order of type, that is, biblical manuscripts first, followed by rabbinic, etc., his method of keeping his inventories was somewhat chaotic. Certainly, the physical evidence suggests that this piece had been rejected a few times before it was acquired by the British Museum in July 1881. With regard to assessing contemporaneous views of the manuscript's inherent value, we can also use Shapira's catalogs to compare what he thought was a worthy manuscript to Stein Schneider's evaluation of their worth. Shapira marked this numbers in his catalog and on the manuscripts themselves with a system of strokes. We heard a little bit about this yesterday. A method he describes as follows, quote, those manuscripts seem, to my humble opinion, a special interesting, I put two strokes under the number, and those most interesting three, end quote. In this earlier catalog, A, Shapira tended to use three strokes more often for manuscript copies of the Pentateuch, especially those on parchment. Shapira and Steinschneider both regarded his manuscript number 33, an early 8th or 9th century parchment copy of the Hebrew Bible with Babylonian vocalization, 
as important. Some of the other pieces Shapiro believed were special were those with unusual text or vocalization or with questionable dates. For example, number 32, which he describes at length. These manuscripts, however, were passed over by Steinschneider, possibly due to his concerns surrounding the authenticity of some of these little known texts. By the time Shapiro compiled his later catalog C, he was applying multiple strokes to the type of items previously purchased by the Royal Library. For example, he gave his manuscript number 69, a copy of the writings, five strokes. He did not change the number of strokes under the Midrash Haggadol, keeping them at two, but he wisely adopted, excuse me, wisely added multiple strokes to copies of the previously unknown Midrash HaChefetz by Shlomo HaRofei, a copy of which he had already sold to Berlin, manuscript Oriental Porto 577 in 1877. The importance of both Yemenite Midrashim lies in their inclusion of ancient rabbinic sources exclusively in the possession of the Yemenites. Thus, Shapiro's catalog provides evidence of both his expanding knowledge of Yemenite works and his growing experience in learning the antiquities trade. Shapiro's sales to the Royal Library mark a shift in his career. He had sold manuscripts in the late 1860s and early 1870s, but the evidence suggests that these sales happened all or mostly in Jerusalem. The one exception is a handful of manuscripts and scrolls consigned to Johannes Alt, who appears to have acted briefly as an agent for Shapira in Europe around 1869 to 1870. In 1873, Shapira sold approximately 1,800 of fake items of so-called Moabite pottery to the German government in two installments. Shapira came to Berlin that May to get advice on packing the initial shipment of Moabitica. On that same trip, he would have also sold his first two manuscripts to the Royal Library. He sold two more later that same year, probably when he returned with the Moabitica in August. Besides those few manuscripts, Shapiro did not approach any European library again until 1877. But from then on, he traveled roughly annually to England and Germany, selling hundreds of manuscripts to the Royal Library in Berlin, the British Museum, and the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Shapiro's shift in markets appears to have accompanied a shift in how he acquired his manuscripts. We have little evidence of his sources in the early years of his career, but we know that he acquired at least some locally in Jerusalem. For example, the digital record for British Museum Oriental 1487, a 15th century vellum copy of a commentary on the Pentateuch by Abraham Ibn Ezra, reveals that one of the fly leaves of the manuscript originally contained a handwritten note by Shapira that had become an art by a piece of paper. The note now hidden by this paper read, quote, this book was purchased by me from one of the chief rabbis in Jerusalem in October 1868, end quote. From 1877, however, Shapira began to travel regularly abroad to Yemen, Cairo, and perhaps Hit in Iraq. It is probably not coincidental that Shapira's first documented trip abroad to acquire manuscripts to Yemen in 1877 took place in the same year that he began dedicated sales to European institutions. Needing more and better manuscripts, Shapira needed to expand his sources and travel to these places himself. Shapira was not the first manuscript dealer from Palestine to approach European institutions. In the late 1840s, Nathan Coronel, a Dutch rabbi who had settled in Jerusalem, started coming to England to sell manuscripts. He was followed by the Samaritan Jacob Eschelebi of Nablus in the 1850s, and another Jerusalem rabbi, Jacob Safir, in the 1860s. In the 1870s, all these dealers were selling manuscripts to the British Museum, the Bodleian, and or Cambridge University Library, along with Shapira. With the circulation of texts from the Cairo Geniza in the early 1890s, Another round of manuscripts was sold to the same institutions by Rabbi Shlomo Wertheimer and the merchant Samuel Rafalovich, both of Jerusalem. This turn to selling items in Europe was part of a much broader pattern at the time. By the 1860s, the Kaborsi family of Nazareth had started to ship antiquities, especially coins, to France for sale and to bring them in person. In the early 1890s, the French scholar Charles Clermont Gonneau commented, quote, these merchants from the Orient who come from time to time to bring antiquities to Europe, end quote. That is, it was a recognized phenomenon by this point. And in the same period, sellers of religious souvenirs, or objets de piété, that Jerusalem was famous for, including beads, rosaries, and various other items of olive wood and mother of pearl, also brought their wares increasingly to Europe and the United States. In fact, the late 19th century is marked by mass movement of people from the Levant, as from southern and eastern Europe, enabled by technological changes such as the rise and development of steamships and railroads, and the ease and lesser expense of international travel that these created. To put it another way, the same steamships 
that brought more tourists to Palestine also brought more merchants from Palestine to Europe and eventually America. This explains the general conditions under which residents of Palestine and other parts of the Middle East increasingly came to Europe and America in the later 19th century, whether just to do business or to settle permanently. But there are also specific reasons why sellers of manuscripts and other antiquities would come to Europe. Quite simply, they could make more money selling items to institutions and collectors in Europe than to visitors to their shops or homes in the Levant. The process by which an antiquity made its way from fine spot to European institution was a securitist one. It involved some combination of finder, agent, dealer in Palestine, dealer in Europe, collector, auction house, and finally library or museum. The result of these many hands and many transactions and many competing buyers was that the price for an item would rise substantially by the time a museum or private collection purchased it. Understandably, collections in Europe and dealers in Palestine were both interested in streamlining the process, cutting out the middlemen and competition, and increasing profits and decreasing costs. European institutions bought more manuscripts and paid more for them than tourists in Jerusalem. Marketing goods directly to Europe might lead to more profits for dealers while still allowing potentially cheaper acquisitions for museums. In Shapira's case, we can see that selling manuscripts to European institutions might have profited him immensely. The pilgrim and tourist souvenirs in his shop would not have made him much money. Books and items of clothing for sale in 1872, for instance, were valued at five francs apiece, that is, about a fifth of a pound. The prices for clothing at least correspond roughly to what we know elsewhere in the country at the time, suggesting little markup. Antiquities were more profitable. The 1,800 items of fake Moabite pottery that he sold to the German government went for about $18,000, that is, 2,700 pounds. In other words, about a pound and a half per item. In Jerusalem, meanwhile, he sold individual items for five, 25 francs, one pound each. In other words, not only were the antiquities worth more in Europe, but he was able to sell them in bulk there and still for a higher price per item than in his Jerusalem shop. Shapir's manuscripts were more valuable still. For the Yemenite manuscripts Shapir offered between 1877 and 1881, the British Museum paid 15 to 20 pounds each. Meanwhile, the Royal Library consistently paid 200 to 280 mark, about 10 to 14 pounds per manuscript, except for 13 manuscripts in 1879, for which it paid about 423 mark, or 21 pounds per manuscript. Yet, despite conditions being ripe for European institutions to profit, the Royal Library took little advantage. Other than Shapira, we've only been able to identify one dealer from Palestine who sold directly to the library in the 19th century, Nathan Coronel, who sold two manuscripts to it in 1865. Why did the Royal Library not acquire manuscripts from dealers in Palestine? We do not yet have a definitive answer, but we can make some suggestions. One possibility is that most dealers had closer ties to Britain. Nathan Coronel and Jacob Shelby were both British protégés, and the latter also had ties to British consular official E.T. Rogers, and possibly to British missionaries in Jerusalem. Samuel Rafalovich had lived in England. His partner, Moses Goldstein, was born there, and Rafalovich entered the manuscript trade after Solomon Schechter connected with Rafalovich's social circle in Jerusalem in 1897. Shapiro was unusual in that he had ties to Germany as well as to England. He had worked for the English mission in Jerusalem, but had close connections to German missionaries in the city as well, and his church was part of a point, excuse me, joint British-German bishopric. It's important to note, though, that Jacob Saphir had Prussian protection, but is not known to have sold manuscripts to German institutions. Another possibility, different models for acquisition of manuscripts and antiquities operated among the different European powers. It has been recognized for some time, for instance, that Britain and France employed different means to acquire antiquities. British efforts characterized by public-private partnerships while France tended to organize large government expeditions. Perhaps Germany, unlike Britain, preferred relying on its own missions. Over 7,400 of the roughly 10,600 Oriental manuscripts acquired by the Royal Library between 1850 and 1890 came from the collections of the European scholars and diplomats Wettstein, Petermann, Sprunger, Minutoli, Lonberg, Sachau, and Glaser, as we've already seen here. In Shapira's case, he approached the Royal Museum first but they selected only a small number of manuscripts with a bulk left for the British institutions. So 36 bought from Shapir himself by the Royal Library versus some 250 by the British Museum. It may also be that dealers from Palestine sold manuscripts to European booksellers 
who then sold some of these items to German and other European institutions. Well-known booksellers like Fischl Hirsch, A. Asher and Company, and Samuel Schoenblum all appear repeatedly in the Royal Library's accessions. The question then is where they got their stock of manuscripts. Finally, we might consider that the Royal Library is not particularly interested in manuscripts from Palestine or in Hebrew manuscripts. The manuscripts Shapira's shop in Europe, after all, came largely from Yemen, Egypt, and Iraq, not from Palestine. Compare this situation with Arabic manuscripts, where in the years around 1900, the Royal Library brought almost 200 from the Paris-based Iraqi dealer Ibrahim Elias Jeju, along with smaller numbers from Gabriel Sethian and J.J. Naaman of Baghdad. The trend of buying Arabic and not Hebrew manuscripts from sellers based in Cairo, Beirut, and Baghdad only increased over the early 20th century. Whereas the negative impact of Shapira's collecting activities on the Jewish communities of Yemen have been illustrated by scholars such as Noah Gerber, the positive outcome of his manuscript sales to European libraries, that is, helping further academic knowledge of Yemenite Jewish history and culture, is largely unsung. In 1891, the growing presence of Yemenite manuscripts in European institutions and the growing scholarship on them enabled Adolf Neubauer to compile the first published survey of Yemenite literature. Neubauer recognized Jacob Safir's great contribution to scholarship on this subject. His failure to mention Shapira could be attributed to the fact that Stein Schneider's second catalog, which would include Shapira's 1879 and 1881 contributions to the Royal Library, wasn't published yet. Nor were the catalogs revealing the sheer extent of his collections in the British Library. Nevertheless, over 100 years later, Shapira's absence from this body of scholarship remains virtually unchanged. In addition to their impact on scholarship, Shapira's manuscript sales are also important for pointing to important changes in the trade in Palestine at the time. The increasing contacts that merchants in Palestine and the broader Middle East made with institutions and individual collectors in both Europe and the United States were one of the major factors that transformed the antiquities trade in this period. Prior to the late 19th century, it does not appear that any dealer, even Moses Shapira, made a living solely or primarily through sales of antiquities. By 1890s, this had begun to change. At that point, Merchants start to be listed in directories and guidebooks as selling antiquities, and they start advertising themselves as antiquities dealers. Dealers like Joseph Ange Durigello in Sidon, Aziz Hayat in New York via Tyre, and Ibrahim Elias Jeju in Paris via Baghdad all thrived in the business for decades, often becoming wealthy, wealthy and offered honors and status by European governments. And all this happened even though both their digging activities and their export of antiquities violated Ottoman law. The antiquities trade, it is clear, had come of age. Thank you for listening.